you'll take your Bibles this morning, open up to John chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 31 through 47. John chapter 8, and we've heard already this morning, the verses read, we've heard a song that keys in on the theme of what we're talking about this morning. John chapter 8, verse 32, you can see it in your Bibles. This is a famous verse. It says, John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I bet you, even if you didn't know that was in the Bible, you've probably heard that phrase before. It's a popular phrase. People use that phrase in different contexts. In fact, I looked up that phrase to see where it's used, and it's actually the official motto of Johns Hopkins University. They have it written in Latin, veritas vos liberate, which means the truth shall set you free. The phrase is actually inscripted under the wall of the CIA building. The original CIA building had this inscripted on the wall. Now, I'm not sure I would trust the government with any level of truth, right? But that was on the CIA wall, inscripted on the wall. People have changed this phrase a little bit. Someone said this once, the truth will set you free, but it will first make you miserable. Someone said that. Another person said the truth will set you free unless you're guilty because then you're going to go to jail. So people have kind of tweaked this, and it's been used in popular culture. In fact, even in movies, a number of years ago, there was a movie with Jim Carrey called Liar, Liar, and he's in a courtroom scene. He's an attorney, and he yells out this verse, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I don't think it was Jim Carrey's intent to quote the Bible, but he did. And you see this in popular culture, this phrase, is out there. And a lot of people don't know what this means, and people maybe don't know that it's from the Scriptures. This phrase is usually understood to mean that academic learning is the key to liberty. Sociologists and politicians sometimes say that the biggest issue in the ills of our society is lack of education. And that is wrong, because the biggest problem in our society is not lack of education, it's our sinful hearts. And that's what Jesus is talking about, is our sinful hearts. And he's saying that we can have freedom, and he's setting us free, not through knowledge, but he's setting us free through salvation, to set us free from our sinful desires, because the problem in our society is not lack of education, it's not head knowledge, the problem is our sinful hearts and needing to be set free by Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus was aiming at in this section Only Jesus offers true freedom because Jesus came to save us from ourselves. He came to save us from our sin. He came to save us from our desires. And so what is the crux of this passage? What's the real meaning here in the text? And I want you to look in your Bibles and we can see where the crux of the passage is here. It's between verses 30 and 31. We ended last week with verse 30. Jesus is preaching to a crowd of people. They're going back and forth. And this is what it says in John 8, 30. Look at your Bibles with me. It says, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Well, you read that and you think, well, great. People are coming to know Jesus, right? They're coming to believe. They're accepting what he's saying. They're accepting who he is. Not so fast. Because look at verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, same group of people here, these people that had believed him, he said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. So suddenly, verse 31, we get the picture that maybe they aren't truly believers. You still doubt that? As we go on, Jesus keeps talking to this group of people, and eventually he says to them, you are children of Satan. So we know from that that these aren't true believers. And so we've got this tension in the text. Verse 30, many believed in him. Verse 31, Jesus turns to this group of people who believed in him and begins to have an argument with those people. Now some folks look at this text and they think that maybe this is a different group of people. Look at verse 33. It says, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham. Some people believe that the they is a new group of people than the ones who believed him in verse 30, but I don't think the grammar allows you that liberty because it's very tight. Verse 30 says, many believed in him. Verse 31, Jesus said to that group of people who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, you will know the truth, the truth will set you free, and they answered. Who's the they? 
the they, the antecedent for they goes back to those who had believed in him. I mean, you just, you just can't get around it. It's the same group. And so in verse 30, there's people that, quote unquote, believed in him. Verse 31, he turns and talks to these people and says, if you really are my followers, then you'll do this. And then it shows that they weren't truly his followers. And so who were these people in verse 30? Verse 30 said, as he was speaking, many came to believe in him. What kind of belief was this? Well, evidently, it was some kind of surface belief. They had made an outward profession, but it didn't go very deep. They had believed in him at some surface level, but now in the rest of the text, what Jesus is doing is trying to show them that they actually don't believe, and he's delineating what true belief looks like versus phony belief. So let me just give you the 30,000 view on this text. Okay, so taking off, flying down to Phoenix like our teens will be doing later, 30,000 feet, looking down over this text. Let me give you the 30,000 view of 30,000 foot view of this text. Look at verse 32. It says, and you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. So what ensues here is an argument between Jesus and these people. Jesus is trying to show them they don't actually believe, and they're trying to prove to Jesus that they do believe, that they are spiritually okay. Jesus says, no. In verse 32, you are enslaved. They respond to Jesus. We're not enslaved. We're children of Abraham. Jesus says back to them in verse 34, well, you might be biological children of Abraham, but you're not spiritual children of Abraham. And the, tr the proof of that is that you don't like what I have to say and that you want to kill me. Abraham wouldn't have done that. If you're spiritually related to Abraham, you would like what I have to say. Jesus goes on in verse 38, and he says, actually, you're being informed by your real father. They respond to Jesus, and they say, Abraham is our real father. Jesus says back to them, no, Abraham is not your real father. If Abraham was your real father, then you would like me, but you don't like me. You want to kill me. Verse 41, look with me. It says this. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. So what do they do then? Well, they come back to Jesus and they say to him, you were born illegitimately. Your mom was pregnant before she was married. Man, I mean, this is getting like Jerry Springer level here, right? They're going back and forth and like, well, your mom wasn't married when she got pregnant with you. You know, I mean, this is, this is crazy. And so Jesus answers back to them, verse 44, you are of your father the devil. Your will is to do your father's desire. And Jesus basically replies back to them, well, at least my father is God. Your daddy is the devil. <laughs> now, at this moment, his disciples are kind of standing there, and they had to have been thinking to themselves, this is getting awkward, right? I mean, this would have been a millennial's nightmare. Millennials hate awkwardness. I mean, awkward. This, I don't want to be here for this. I mean, this is just getting very uncomfortable and you can feel the tension rising. What's the point of this argument? Well, verse 30 says that many came to believe. Jesus looks at those people who believed and he's essentially saying to them, you don't actually believe. You might say you believe, but you don't actually believe. And he begins to show them why they don't actually believe. So why is it that they don't believe? Well, I want to pull out four key verses here as we continue our 30,000 foot overview of the text. Just four key verses that helps us to delineate what's going on. Look with me at verses 31 and 32 again. Verses 31 and 32 define for us what true belief looks like. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you are truly my disciples, you will abide. See, your problem is that you can't abide in my truth. Why can't they abide in his truth? Look over at verses 43 to 44. Why do you not understand what I say? In other words, why can't you abide like I'm saying? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. Why can't you bear to hear my word? Because you are related to a different dad. Satan is your father. That's why you can't abide. 
Abiding in my word is the mark of a true disciple. You can't abide because you don't like what I say because Satan is your father. Verse 45, he goes on and he says it like this again in verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. You have no ears to hear the truth. Then verse 47, this kind of frames the whole passage. Verse 31 starts it. Verse 47 ends it. It's the frame for the whole passage. Verse 47 says it like this, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you don't hear hear the words of God is because you are not of God. You can't abide in the truth because only those who are related to God will abide in the truth, and you are not related to God. And so, there's some tension in this text, and there's tension in this text related to our culture and our world as well today. And I want to kind of show you the key issue in this text. I want you to read this. I want you to think about it. I want it to sink into your head because I think we need to do more of this in our world today as it relates to people who claim to be Christians. That's really what's happening here. These people are claiming to be followers of Jesus. How many people in America claim to be Christians? That's a huge percentage. But Jesus would have some harsh words for those people who claim to be Christians. Here's the key issue in this text. Sometimes phony believers can show convincing signs of being true believers. Sometimes phony believers can show some convincing signs of being true believers. Verse 30, as Jesus was saying these things, many came to believe in him. Really? How deep was their belief? Jesus goes on to show them how deep their belief was. So even as I say these things this morning, I'm looking out on a crowd of people, and I think there's three categories of people here this morning. There may be people who are unbelievers, and when I say unbelievers, I mean people who aren't even faking to be believers or Christians, people that are rejecting the truth of Jesus Christ that are here for whatever reason. I'm glad you're here. If that's you this morning, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening to the truth of the Word of God. You need to be here. You need to listen. And ultimately, you need to accept that Jesus Christ is God and that He died to take the penalty for your sins. You need to be saved today. That's the first classification of people. Second type of person that could be here today is a phony believer, a person that claims to be a Christian, a person that claims to follow Jesus, but who is actually an unbeliever. That's what Jesus is talking about today. The third type of person here this morning is a true believer, a person who's abiding in Jesus' word. What does it look like to be a true believer? Go back with me to verses 31 and 32 as we continue the 30,000 foot fly over the text. Verses 31 and 32 say this, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. True disciples abide in the Word. True disciples abide in Jesus' teaching. They remain. Another word you could use here is hold fast to. You hold to Jesus' teaching. A genuine believer remains in Jesus' word, remains in his teaching. Such a person obeys it, understands it, seeks to understand it more, seeks to find it more, seeks to read it more, seeks to drink it in more. That's what a true believer looks like. That's what Jesus is saying a true believer is, is someone who abides. One author put it like this, a true believer, someone who's abiding in the Word, is someone who's persuaded of its truth and the attraction of its beauty. You treasure its value. You recognize the peacefulness of its grace and power. You love it for the nourishment of its bread and the refreshment of its water and the brightness of its light. Abiding in the Word means that you never cease to eat and drink of the Word of God. It is like bread and water for your soul. It satisfies you. That's what Jesus is saying a true believer is like. Someone who is satisfied by the words of Jesus. So how do we know if someone's a phony believer? How do we know if we're a phony believer? Well, in this text, I think Jesus gives some characteristics of phony believers. I want you to see, number one, a phony believer, instead of abiding in the truth, instead of abiding in the words of Jesus, instead of holding fast to Jesus, a phony believer abides instead in his own religion. 
And that's what these people were doing in this text this morning, verses 33 through 38. They kept linking themselves back into Abraham. They had a self preceded freedom. They thought they were free because they were related to Abraham. Freedom was very important for the Jewish people. They hated the idea of being in slavery. Jesus says to them, the truth will set you free. His implication is that they weren't free. His implication is that they were enslaved. They knew that, and so in verse 33, they respond like this. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? Their love for freedom almost made them delusional. (laughs) I love how they say, we've never been enslaved to anybody. Uh, I wonder if they had revisionist history going on in their schools for their kids because they had forgotten about a lot of slavery. Right? They had been enslaved to many different people groups throughout the years. But I think really what they're saying is this in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles, as we've been talking about, and this conversation happens in the Feast of Tabernacles as well. They were celebrating God leading them through the wilderness for 40 years. They were celebrating the freedom from Egypt, the freedom of coming out from underneath the yoke of bondage in Egypt. I think what they had in mind is as the children of Abraham, God would never allow them to be in slavery very long. Because even as they're saying this, they're under the thumb of Rome, but they believed that because they were Jews, because they had Abraham's blood coursing through their veins, that God would set them free. And that's what they were waiting for. That's what they wanted from the Messiah. That's what they were hoping for from the Messiah. When Jesus didn't meet those expectations, they were done with him because freedom for them was everything. And because they were connected to Abraham, they thought they would ultimately have freedom. They were connecting their spiritual freedom to their lineage in Abraham. Slaves? What do you mean? We're not slaves. We're free. Why? Because we're related to Abraham. We're children of Abraham. We're good to go. And many people in our culture today do something similar. Many people you might meet on the street and ask them about their Christianity, ask them about their spiritual walk. If you come up to somebody on the street and you ask them this question, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? What do you think the vast majority of people will answer? The vast majority of people, as, as I've come in contact with people, say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. That's how people often answer. I think, or they say, well, I, I hope so, right? What are they basing their hope on? Well, they're basing their hope on some kind of religious experience. Sometimes I hear this phrase, this comes up a lot. I'm good, I'm Catholic. I hear that a lot, right? As if just somehow being Catholic makes you okay. Well, that kind of an answer is not new. That's the answer that these, these Israelites were giving as well. We're okay, we're related to Abraham. We're covered under the Abraham thing. And maybe some people might think, well, we're covered under our baptism or that we've always been Christians or that I was raised in the church or maybe this would hit closer to home for people in our types of churches. I'm okay. I prayed a prayer one time when I was a kid to accept Jesus. I'm good. Really? So the people in this text are claiming some kind of a religious experience. And how often do we claim some kind of a religious experience when we're faced with that question as well. Are you going to go to heaven when you die? Are you free from your sin? Well, of course. I prayed a prayer when I was a kid. Of course, I've I've always come to church. Of course, I've always done what I'm supposed to do and, and what my religion says I'm supposed to do. You're banking on your religiousness to set you free. Jesus presses them further. He's challenging them to go deeper than the surface. He says he offers true freedom. Verses 34 and 35, Jesus answers, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave. Jesus makes it clear here. He's not talking about Roman in slavery. He's talking about sinful in slavery. You are enslaved by your sin, and your connection to Abraham does not necessarily free you from your sin. Just like for us. Just praying a prayer does not necessarily free you from the slavery of your sin. It could be a good religious exercise to do. There's no magic in it. He goes on and says in verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. And he says to them in that verse, 
you're right, you are related to Abraham, you're genetically related to Abraham, you're living in the right house, but you're not spiritually related to Abraham, and he draws a line of differentiation between physical and spiritual relation to Abraham. You're in the right house, but you're in that house as a slave and not a son, and you have to be a son. A slave can go, a son remains forever. And then he says, who the son sets free is free indeed. He's claiming to be the true son. He's saying, I can connect you spiritually to Abraham. And then verse 37, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, but yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. You are physically related to Abraham, but you are not spiritually related to Abraham. And many people in our world today may claim to be okay. You may claim spiritual freedom. They may claim, well, I got baptized when I was a baby or I've done all these things right or I'm part of this religion. I'm okay. I'm free from my sin. But you're really not free from your sin unless the Son has set you free because that's where there's true freedom is in Jesus Christ. But friends, we are slaves to sin before we meet Jesus. Our sin does enslave us. John Calvin said it like this, the greater the mass of vices anybody is buried under, the more fiercely and bombastically does he extol free will. That is a great quote. You see people living their lives literally driving themselves to hell with vices and with sin, all the time shaking their fists saying, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm living my life the way I want to live it. And it's driving them to the grave. We are enslaved to our sin. Sin enslaves us by producing compelling desires. It makes dangerous things seem wonderful. Satan tricks us into thinking that rebelling against God is freedom. But rebelling against God is not freedom. God wants to protect us. Rebellion against God is a dangerous place to be. The drug addict does not want to be told, don't take drugs. However, he ends up burnt out. His life is a wreck and he's homeless because of his habit. Pornography seems so alluring to bring life and excitement, but it will ruin your life and your relationships. Gossip, for a while, seems to win you friends and give you the opportunity to have juicy conversation with the people around you, but as the book of Proverbs says, gossip will separate even the best of friends. Lying may get you out of a sticky situation, for a time. Well, that's a lesson if you're a parent, you're constantly doing that with your kids, aren't you? Don't lie, don't lie. It'll make it easy for a moment. But at the end is death. You see, our sin does enslave us and it leads us to the grave. I have a friend who's always telling me all the things that I'm missing out on because I don't have a dog. That's what he keeps telling me. Now, if you've sat in this church for very long, you know that my family's not really a pet family. Never had a dog, never had a pet. Oh, I'll caveat that. I had a salamander when I was a kid, okay? That counts. And some fish. Fish are great pets, aren't they? Low maintenance. uh, not, Not so good on the petting side of it, you know, but they're good pets. But I have a friend, he he's got a dog. He loves dogs, and he's always telling me, oh, man, you're just missing out so much. And he makes it sound like my life is just a depressing mess because I don't have a dog. Like I'm missing out on some kind of freedom in my life because I don't have a dog. Well, this friend is getting ready to move, and they're moving from one state to another state, and they, they're going to look at housing. And for a period of time, they're planning on renting some housing until they look the market over and finally are able to buy. And so it's just him and his wife. They don't have any kids in the house anymore. And so he's showing me pictures of these houses, and they're all really big houses with lots of bedrooms and big yards. And and I'm thinking, why why are you going with for such big houses? And you know, I'm thinking you're gonna rent for a year, just get an apartment. I asked him, yeah, I'm just why don't you get an apartment? He says, Well, because a lot of apartments aren't pet friendly and we need to have a yard. It's got to be close to trails. You know, it really all comes down to the dog. And of course, as he says that, I'm smiling on the other side of the phone. <laughs> like, this is awesome. Uh, I'm like, just relishing this opportunity. So what you're saying, and of course, I'm just, enjo- every word, I'm just enjoying it so much. What you're saying is that this dog is dictating these decisions for you. <laughs> you know, I'm just laughing. 
<laughs> so what you're saying, you're gonna spend a lot more money on a place to rent because you have this dog. As he's telling me all the freedom and joy that it brings, I'm thinking, dude, you are in slavery. I mean, this, this dog is running your life. Let me ask you, who's the master and who's the pet here, huh? Who's the master? Who picks up whose doo-doo, all right? That's what I'm going to ask here. Who's the master and who's the pet? Yeah, that's what I thought. And I look at that, and I'm like, that guy's in slavery, right? He, he's in slavery to this pet. But that's how it works with sin, isn't it? It's how it works with sin. It's how our sinful desires work. Think about in your life the decisions that you make. What's calling the shots of your decisions? For my friend, the fact that they have a dog is calling the shots. But in our lives, what calls the shots for you? How do you make your decisions? What's informing your choices? Is abiding in Christ's truth informing your choices? Or are your sinful desires informing your choices? When you make choices in your life about how you spend your money, about where you live, how you spend your time, what you watch on television, what informs your choices? Is it abiding in the truth of the Word? Or is it your sinful desires? You see, many of us are far more enslaved to our sinful desires than we can ever imagine. But there's so much freedom when we abide in the truth of the word. The other day I read 1 Corinthians 13. I was just thinking, here's truth from the word. This is truth, right? Abiding. What would happen if we abided in this truth? 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love always expects the best of other people. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Friends, that is truth. That is freedom. What if you were to apply that and live that out in your marriage every day? That's freedom. Jesus says in verses 31 and 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free as you abide in the truth of Jesus. It sets you free from your sinful, selfish desires. That's the freedom Jesus is talking about, not the freedom of just doing empty religion. The people in this text had empty religion, and it was not setting them free. I want you to go on to the next idea this morning. Jesus gives us these characteristics. The first is a phony believer abides in his own religion. Secondly, a phony believer abides in his own Righteousness, verses 43 through 47. And so this argument continues on that he's having with the people. If you go back to verse 39, it says, They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus says, If you were Abraham's children, then you would know what Abraham did. What Jesus is talking about is Abraham's righteousness. They were linking their lineage with Abraham to the law. They were saying, because we are children of Abraham, we have the law. Because we have the law, we obey it. Because we obey the law, we're good. We are righteous. And they were claiming righteousness by way of the law because they were connected to Abraham. Jesus calls their bluff. Really? You think you're righteous? You think you act like Abraham acts? He says in verse 39, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? Abraham was chosen by God. Abraham was revealed to by God. God came to Abraham and gave his word, and Abraham believed it, and he took God's word and had faith. And that's not what they're doing. Jesus says, I came from the Father. I am God. Abraham listened and obeyed God's voice. If you did what Abraham did, you would hear my voice and you would obey my voice because you would realize it's the voice of God as Abraham recognized the voice of God and he obeyed it and had faith in the voice of God. You're not Abraham's children. And they were claiming righteousness by being Abraham's children. And it goes on and they give this this really, really uh, terrible insult to Jesus here in verse 41. It says, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. They dig into his background. They know something didn't quite line up right with the way that he was born. And they were saying, look, they were stacking their righteousness against the righteousness of the Son of God. Because they thought they were so righteous. 
They thought they were so good, and this was a self-righteous jab. You know, it's not a far stretch in our world for people to be dependent upon their own righteousness either. People thinking that they're okay, people who stand before God and think that somehow they're going to present their merits, and I always ask this question to people, if you stood before God and he said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you tell them? What would you tell God in that moment? Would you put forth your own righteousness? Would you say, look, it's because I've done this, or I'm not as bad as this person? Would you bring some kind of comparative righteousness? That's what they were doing in this text. We're okay. We're children of Abraham. We obey the law. We're righteous. We're trusting in our own righteousness. And Jesus says, no, you're not righteous. And the reason you're not righteous is because you're not related to God. You are related to the devil. Verse 41, you are doing what your father did. And they have to be a little confused here because he keeps saying this father language. He's actually getting later to the fact that they're related to the devil. But you do what your father did. You're related to Satan, not God. And so then he moves into the third idea here. A phony believer, thirdly, also abides in his own rules or his own morality, you could say. A phony believer makes his or her own rules about what truth actually is. And Jesus connects it here to verses 43 and 44, and he says, why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You hear what I'm saying, you cannot bear to hear my word. Why? Verse 44 answers, here's the reason why you can't bear to hear my word. It's because you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. You're Satan's child. Now this gives us some interesting language. This shows us that there are really only two types of people in this world. There are only two families. You're either part of God's family or you're part of Satan's family. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral ground. Somebody that's not in Christ is an enemy of God. Someone who's not in Christ is in Satan's family. There's only two families to be part of, God's or Satan's family. And so he characterizes Satan here. He's telling these people, you are Satan's children, therefore you act like your daddy. Who is Satan? How does Satan act? Well, he says, verse 44, he was a murderer from the beginning. That's where your murderous desires come from. Jesus says, you want to murder me. Why do you want to murder me? Because you are Satan's child, and Satan was a murderer from the beginning, like father, like child, right? My wife has taught my daughter this little phrase. She'll do something that's like me. She'll say something like me. She likes a food that's, that I like or something, and Liz has taught Zoe this phrase. I'm my father's daughter. That's what she says. I'm my father's daughter. And she loves, she walks around repeating that. She'll do something, I'm my father's daughter. Why? Like father, like daughter, right? We do pass on certain characteristics. Our kids are like us. Jesus says, you want to kill me. Where did you get that desire from? You got that desire from your dad. And your dad's Satan. Satan was a murderer from the beginning. But he's also a liar. Look what it says here in, in verse 44. He was a murderer and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Why does he lie? Because he's a liar. That's why he lies. He has no truth in him. He's a liar by nature. For he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth... You don't believe me. Because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. When you hear truth, you reject it because you are related to your father, the devil, who's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. He speaks out of his own character. And man, that's one of Satan's favorite tricks, isn't it? To twist the truth, to lie. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Satan comes to Adam and Eve and God has said to Adam and Eve, do not eat of the fruit of this tree. Satan comes to Adam and Eve and says, God says you can't even touch that fruit. No, that's not what God said. God said don't eat of it. Satan twists the truth and says you're not supposed to touch it. God says to them, if you eat of the fruit, you'll surely die. And God meant spiritually die. Satan comes to Adam and Eve and says, if you eat of that fruit, you're not going to die. Try it. Take the fruit, bite in. Guess what? We didn't die. Guess God was lying. No, you died spiritually. God wasn't talking about physical death right then. Satan loves to twist the truth. See, this is sneaky. This is how Satan works. And phony believers work like this as well. They twist the truth. They modify the truth. They take the truth like they want to hear the truth. They take the word of God and they twist it and they use it for their own purposes. It's sneaky. 
There's a lot of Christians that are actually so-called Christians that are children of Satan. Watch how they twist the truth. This is a stark contrast to abiding in the truth and taking what Jesus says and living that out. Phony Christians will twist and reinvent the truth. I've heard people say things like this before. Well, I can be a believer without being involved in a local church. We don't need the church. I can be a Christian that way. Really? Have you ever, by chance, read the New Testament? Have you ever read the New Testament before? I mean, I'm pretty sure like the entire New Testament is in the context of a local church. How, how do you twist that truth like that? I've heard people say things like this, God doesn't care how I handle my finances or how much I give. Really? You know that Jesus talked about finances more than almost any other subject when he was here on earth? I hear people say something like this, you know, the Bible's sexual ethics, they were culturally bound. They don't apply for today. Really? Have you, have you read the New Testament on sexual ethics? How are you twisting that truth for your own uses? I've heard people say the Bible doesn't speak like issues about abortion. Are you sure about that? Are, are we reading the same Bible? <laughs> You see, people who are phony believers take the Word of God and they twist it. They use it for their own purposes. They distort the truth. Why? Because they're related to Satan. And in Satan, there's no truth. All that Satan does is twist the truth. So phony believers take the truth and they twist it. So we come to the concluding verse in verse 47. I love how this ends. It says, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is because you are not of God. Now, I just, just think about this verse again. This is a very fascinating verse because it's opposite of what you might think it is. Most of the time, we think of it like this, that I believe, and once I believe, then I become of God. Okay, look at the words here in verse 47. Whoever is of God. God. The word of God means belongs to God or is born of God. Okay? So whoever is born of God. So usually we think we believe and then we're born of God. Look what verse 47 does. It reverses the order. Whoever, verse 47, is born of God hears the words of God. And so he's saying very clearly, this is an expansion on chapter 6 where he says things like, unless the Father draws someone, they can't come to me. You can't come to me unless the Father grants it to you. Unless the Father opens your eyes. Jesus gets even more explicit here in verse 47. Whoever is born of God hears the words. And so you don't hear and accept until you're born of God. God has to initiate this process in your heart. That's how Jesus ends this. So why don't these people believe? Because they haven't been born of God yet. Once they're born of God, then they believe. Why weren't they believing? Because they didn't belong to God yet. So as we come down to verse 47, it kind of gives us the entire idea for this whole chapter here. A true believer hears and abides. Why? Because he belongs to or is born of God. Phony believers can fake belief. Real believers are born of God, and because they're born of God, they hear, they understand, they accept, they believe, they abide in what Jesus says. Friends, sometimes phony believers can show convincing signs of being a true believer, and I hope this morning this is encouraging to those of you who are true believers today. hope this is encouraging to you to continue on, to keep abiding, to keep drinking from the fountain of life, which is Jesus Christ. And I hope this morning, if you are a phony believer or an unbeliever here this morning, that you would heed the words of this text and that God would wake up your heart and that God would give you that new life in your heart so that you could be born of him and hear and believe the words of Jesus. I love the lyrics of an old hymn called And Can It Be. It captures it so well. It says this, Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. 
Look what happens. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. Who started it? God started it. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And all God's people said, Amen.